All right, hello. Welcome everyone. As you start to file in, um, this is uh, how to plan and finish your next big project project strategies for artists with Corey Huff. Um, we're so happy to have him uh, join us today for Thrive with Artwork Archive. Um, while we wait for everyone to join in, please introduce yourself in the chat below. Um, you can say your name, where you're from, what time, type of art you make. Um, we'd love to meet you all. Uh, the chat is also a great place to connect with other artists and introduce yourself. Um, and while it is such a great place for that, if you have any questions, the Q&A at the bottom is where you'll want to ask any topic related questions. And then um, we do have a few housekeeping items before we jump into the webinar, but we will wait a few minutes while some more of you uh, get in here. So hello. So many great artists, upstate New York. I'm looking for who, are, who, who the furthest away is. I saw somebody from Columbia. Wow, Colorado, that's where we're from. Hello, New Zealand. Oh, New Zealand. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I think New Zealand wins. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, Kelowna, British Columbia. Shout out, British Columbia. I love British Columbia. Hawaii. Oh, jealous. Mm. Big island. Oh. Beautiful. Hello, a of, everyone. A lot of islanders here today. Carolinas, lots of New Yorkers. Hey, everybody. Yes, it's Greetings so from Memphis. Ahead. Nice. All right. And then um, this comes up a lot. I'm just going to answer a few questions before we get started. This will be recorded and it will be sent out to everyone who's registered. Um, if you have to leave early, we will send out a recording um, within 24 hours. So check your mailbox. Um, tomorrow and we will send that along with all the slides that has a lot of great resources that Corey has provided um, along with artwork archive so you'll have links to everything that we talk about today so if we go over things a little bit fast you'll be able to go back and dig in a little bit further tomorrow uh, we have left about 30 minutes at the end of the session for a Q&A um, Corey's going to be answering a lot of questions so if you have personal questions that you have about it, or you just have some confusion, put those in the Q&A and we will um, save 30 minutes. So I'll get to what I can at the, while Corey's talking, but then we'll bump those up and then ask you if you have any, uh, if you wanna answer it live, um, and then we'll put you um, in touch with Corey and you'll be able to elaborate on that question as well. So again, use the Q&A for that. And as we've learned in the past Thrive webinars, um, we get so many wonderful questions and suggestions, but we're not always able to get to all of them. So um, if we weren't able to get to yours today, please do reach out directly to us at team at artworkarchive.com or Corey at theabundantartist.com. Um, that said, a few more housekeeping. There is live transcripts on the bottom. So if you look at the bottom down here, um, you should see closed captioning. So uh, you can turn that on if it's not already on for you. And um, you do need the mobile, you do need the app for that. So if you're just web browsing, you might not see it, it might be a little bit different. Um, I think that's it. So we will jump in. I think it's been a few minutes. I think most of you are here. Um, so great to see you. Um, so yeah, welcome again to another installment of Thrive with Artwork Archive. Uh, this is our webinar series that invites art experts around the world to deliver practical advice for artists looking to build an art career. Our hope is that you come away from these sessions with easy to execute strategies and tips to set your art business up for success. I'm Katie. Um, I've been with Artwork Archive for about seven years now, and I'm the head of content. And today we are joined by Corey Huff. Uh, the founder of Abundant Artists, and Corey has been helping artists <laughs> uh, online since 2009. He's based out of Portland, and he's helped hundreds of artists figure out how to navigate a fine art career. He's going to be talking to us about how to plan and finish projects today, specifically for artists. So a range of projects, and he's going to go into like, what's a project look like, what defines a project, and kind of give you some strategies on how to execute those projects without getting overwhelmed. Um, as always, um, welcome to all of you Artwork Archive users. Um, if you aren't familiar with Artwork Archive yet, we're a platform that provides artists with tools they need to get organized, manage, and grow your art business and showcase your artwork online. Um, and we'll be providing some more resources for you to learn more about that at the end as well. 
Um, with that said, I will hand it over to Corey and I'll start our slides. And yeah, then I will go let him take the lead here. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. I really appreciate it. Uh, it I, the Abundant Artist and Artwork Archive have been longtime friends. Uh, so I really appreciate y'all having me uh, here today. And I'm excited to uh, chat with everybody. Uh, obviously, the chat is going by super fast. So if you do have a question, make sure you drop that in the Q&A section. Uh, but it's really, really fun. I, I know it's normal now, but I still get a thrill out of seeing like so many artists from so many places uh, from New Zealand, Poland, you know, British Columbia, all over the United States. Uh, I just I'm, I'm so glad you're here and I feel honored that uh, you're sharing time with us today. So thank you very much. Um, I do want to take some time at the end today to uh, talk about how to implement some of the things that I'm going to, some of the principles I'm going to teach. Uh, so if you're feeling brave or super curious, uh, feel free to raise your hand and say that you'd like to come on live uh, at the end. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, finishing projects, right? And I'll talk about what I mean by projects, but a project can be anything, anything that takes significant time, energy, or attention, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about some specific tactics and strategies for uh, planning and finishing projects, including the five projects rule, project rule, uh, what time blocking is and how artists can uh, use it, uh, the 10-15 split, and then sort of organizational strategies. Uh, so uh, let's, before we get into organizational strategies and all the tactics and everything, let's just talk a little bit about what a project is. Uh, and if we could uh, skip down to slide six, yeah, cool. Uh, so what is a project? How do we define it? Before we talk about how we define projects, I just want to mention uh, for artists, when we're talking about running an art business uh, or running an art practice, uh, there are what, what I break down into five different business models for artists, selling art through galleries, selling art direct to collector, uh, prints and products, commissions and licensing, right? And the reason that I want to mention this here is if you are an artist who is doing all of these things, if you're selling through galleries and selling direct and selling prints and products and doing commissions and licensing, and you're finding yourself stretched in a lot of different ways and you're feeling overburdened and underpaid, uh, I'm going to suggest that you take a look at your art business and say, which of these can I do really well? Which one or two of these can I do really well? And let go of the rest of them until my art business grows to a certain point. We'll talk about that. Uh, but it's not just the business side of your art. Projects are inclusive of your business and your the rest of your life, right? So whether that is, for example, finishing a painting, finishing a series of paintings, uh, getting your website published or updated, uh, opening a new show, figuring out how to price all your work, putting all of your artwork into artwork inventory so that it's all inventoried, um, artwork archive so that it's all inventoried, uh, or even things like planning a vacation or a wedding or, you know, planning your kid's school year, all that kind of stuff, um, or shipping a large piece of art, like whatever it is, uh, it's all part of your life. And uh, a lot of times when we talk about planning and uh, productivity, we artificially bifurcate between the business life and the personal life. And I want to make sure that we're talking about those inclusively. All right. So let's talk about the next uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we're going to talk about some methods for completing projects. And these are high level methods uh, that are essentially tactical. So you can figure out how to finish your stuff. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about how you structure your day, right? So how you structure your day. And this is different for uh, part-time artists versus full-time artists. And when I say part-time versus full-time, I just mean how much time you're spending on the art business. Uh, and there's you know, everybody's a full-time artist in the sense that we all have artist brains all the time. And we all... Uh, you know, live as artists and creators all the time. But some of us, uh, some artists have day jobs or other things that we're doing in addition to whatever our art business is, right? So I'm making a few assumptions as I'm talking here, and I'm assuming that 
Uh, many of you who are who are here today have a goal of making a living from your art. Uh, and so that is what I mean when I say full-time artist, that you have the goal of making a living from your art. Uh, so if you have a day job or some other thing, uh, what I will usually tell artists is plan on, like try to structure your life so that you can spend at least 10 hours a week on your art practice, right? And I'm talking about total time, marketing, admin work, uh, art making, uh, and that you split that time up at least 50-50 on uh, art making versus all the other stuff, right? Uh, a lot of times I'll talk to artists and they'll, and they'll say, oh, I'm spending 20, 30 hours a week on my art business. But what they mean is they're spending 20, 30 hours a week on their art practice, on making work, but not spending any time or, or only spending a few hours a week on the marketing and business side. And what I usually tell artists, if you want to make a living from your work is you need to be spending about 50% of your time making art and the other 50% selling and, and doing the business side. Uh, and it's more about consistency over time than it is about trying to figure out how to fit 10 hours in on a Saturday, right? If you can do one evening per week and an hour or two each morning before the rest of your day starts, that will benefit you more over the course of a year than trying to figure it, uh, trying to fit it in whenever it will fit, because uh, whenever it will fit is usually not very often. Um, and then eliminating distractions. Uh, as a part-time artist, if you're trying to build an art business, uh, it's going to be about eliminating distractions, and I'll talk more about what that means. For you who are here who are already full-time in your art business, uh, I think the most valuable thing you can do is figure out how to set boundaries so that you're preventing burnout in your art business. Uh, I think it's very easy for us to become uh, enamored with and obsessed with our art businesses and want to work 60 to 80 hours a week, uh, which doesn't leave time for recovery and personal maintenance and all that other stuff, uh, when really we need to set boundaries so that we can continue to put in consistent effort over time uh, and being intentional with our time, which we're going to get into uh, and focusing on the highest value work. All right, next slide. So the five projects rule. Uh, the five projects rule comes from a blog post by one of my best friends, Charlie Gilkey. Uh, he's the author of a book called Start Finishing. And uh, full disclosure, I used to work with Charlie. Uh, I used to be the head of marketing for his company. Uh, but I think that some of the, like the five projects rule and some of the other things that I'm going to talk about, I've borrowed from him in his book. And I think they work really well for creative people. Uh, so project, all projects fit into time horizons, right? So you can have five projects a day, five things a day that you're working on. Uh, you can have five projects in a week, uh, or you can have five projects in a month, or you can have five projects in a year, right? And your five yearly projects, let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. Uh, your five yearly projects are going to break down into quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily projects, right? And when we get into daily and weekly, we start talking about in terms of tasks and to-do items rather than projects. But uh, I'm using the word project broadly to describe uh, to describe to-do lists and, and daily tasks when we get down to that level. But every project breaks down into these things, right? So when you're thinking about uh, you know, what is a year a year size project for me? A year size project might be, uh, you know, get to $30,000 in sales for my art this year. That might be a year long project. And then that breaks down into, uh, you know, $7,500 per quarter. Uh, and that breaks down into uh, something a little less than $2,500 per month. Uh, in art sales and so on and so forth. And so you start to break those down into uh, the, their subcategories. Um, next slide, please. And here's what that looks like uh, on some example projects uh, for some artists that I've worked with in the past. Uh, so a month size project might be, uh, I've got a show in a month and I need to finish a series of paintings in order to uh, be ready for that show, right? And uh, that means that in the week, I'm going to do base coats and uh, blocking for each painting in the first week. And then a day-sized task for my month-long project 
might be, I'm going to varnish all the pieces when I finish them, right? These are all just steps in finishing that series, but you get an idea for what those might look like uh, over the course of a month, week, and day. Uh, publishing a website breaks down into sketching out the five pages of your website. Uh, and for those of you who are asking for links and for uh, additional resources, we are going to have all the links and all the resources in the slides at the end of this uh, webinar. And you'll all get a link to the recordings of the webinar as well as the slides. So don't worry about trying to write everything down. I, I want to pause here for a second and say, please don't try to write everything down. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is pay attention to what resonates with you. If something comes up and you're like, oh, I'm curious about that, or oh, I'm excited about that, or oh, you know, that makes me feel something extra emotional, pay attention to that and take notes about that uh, because you can go back and review like specific links and specific resources, but things that stand out to you and, uh, and make you pay attention, those are the things that you probably need to pay attention to in your, in your art business in your life right now. Um, all right, so I want to dive back into what we're talking about here. Uh, so a, a month-sized project might be publishing your website. So it might take a week to sketch out all five pages of your website, and then a daily task might be to take all the written copy and then put, you know, copy and paste that into all the sections of your website. And then you know another month like month-sized project might be open a gallery show which means that in a week you might walk through the space and plan where all the pieces are going to be. And in a day, you might show up at the space early to walk through the time and talk to the gallery in order to prepare for the show. So this is, this is what I'm talking about when I say uh, in each time slice, you get three to five projects that you're going to do. All right. All right. Next slide. Uh, so Rhonda Gray is an artist based in Chicago in the United States, and uh, Rhonda gave us permission to, to share some of her quotes and some of the things that she does uh, to plan her, her week and month. And she says here, you know, find and know your work rhythm. Knowing what tasks uh, I may do better in the morning, noon, or night really helps me effectively schedule my work week, which I really love. Um, so I think somebody asked earlier, what do I mean by uh, figuring out when you can be most effective. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So Rhonda is talking about uh, figuring out time blocking, right? And uh, time blocking is basically just taking your calendar, uh, and I'm assuming that you are using a calendar here, um, that you take your calendar and you sort of break your calendar down into blocks to say, uh, this is how I'm going to spend this time, and this is how I'm going to spend this time. And you try to put the blocks that fit best with your energy uh, each day. Uh, so focus blocks, admin blocks, social blocks, recovery blocks. Let's talk a little bit about what, you, what each of those things are. So a focus block is, uh, generally speaking, it is a 90-minute, two-hour block of time when I uh, you can go deep on something, right? So a focus block might be, I'm going to paint. A focus block might be, I'm going to write my artist statement. Anything that requires a long period of uninterrupted focus in order for you to accomplish a significant task, right? Uh, so then admin blocks, generally speaking, are an hour or less of usually smaller tasks that you chunk together. Um, or it might be one long admin task that might be like taxes. Uh, and so admin blocks uh, are, generally speaking, we have no more than two or three focus blocks in, in, in any given day uh, because we're not capable of maintaining deep levels of concentration for more than a couple of hours at a time and not more than four to six hours per day at the most. Uh, it is very common for people to not be able to have a deep level of concentration for more than four hours in any given day. And if you work from home and you have kids at home, you know that you're lucky to get one solid focus block per day, right? Uh, so that's why it's important to find your focus blocks in the day and schedule those for when you have the most energy, right? Um, then admin blocks, social blocks are exactly what they sound like. It's time where you might schedule meetings. It's time when you might schedule time with friends. Uh, it's time when you are going to be with other people, right? And the reason that Charlie uh, and I like to break out social blocks as separate 
is for a lot of people, social blocks are uh, different. Uh, social blocks for some people are very draining. Social blocks for some people are very energizing. And uh, that, that's why we have social blocks out as their own category. Uh, so recovery blocks are sometimes interchangeable with social blocks. Recovery blocks are uh, adjustable to periods of time when you do whatever you need to recover. And one of the things that I think is missing from the productivity uh, genre as a whole is recovery time, right? Uh, if you spend four to six hours a day deeply focused, you are going to be very tired, uh, at least mentally tired and maybe physically tired if you are spending that time art making. Uh, you need recovery time. And that might be anything from a 15 minute meditation to a half hour nap to an hour of exercise, right? You need recovery time and it's important to build that into your schedule. All right, next slide. So this is a screenshot of uh, Rhonda Gray's planned recovery blocks, right? So you can see green time for her is uh, uh, focus blocks, uh, excuse me, admin blocks, uh, where she's working on grants uh, and tracking financials. Um, the yellow gray, or excuse me, the yellow, goldenrod yellow, and the, I'm having a hard time with the colors on the screen here. The goldenrod blocks are uh, her focus blocks uh, or social blocks. And then the uh, lighter yellow are also focus blocks. So uh, what I will often ask artists to do who are having a hard time managing all the things they're doing is to look through their calendar and say, and do an exercise like this and say, how much of my time am I spending on focus time? How much of my time am I spending on admin? And once you visualize it like this, it starts to get really easy to say, oh, okay, like I see that I'm over-indexed on admin time. I'm spending too much time doing small tasks or switching back and forth. And I could actually just batch those to right before lunch and right before the end of the day, which we'll talk about more in the 10-15 the split. Um, but I strongly recommend the artists everywhere at least go through this exercise once of going back through your time for the last month and breaking it down into these uh, four blocks to see how you're spending your time. And then thinking about what time of day you have the most energy putting your focus blocks there, whether that's, you know, for me, that's early in the morning, eight to 10 AM. I am more productive at that time than I am any other time of the day uh, versus some people are most productive at nine to midnight, nine, 9 PM to midnight, uh, whatever time that is for you, figuring out how to put, put your focus blocks in that most productive time is really helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, another quote from Will Eskridge, who is a painter based in North Carolina in the United States. Uh, so Will says, uh, time blocks for daily tasks have helped me stay focused tremendously. He sets a timer, uh, 20 minutes for social, 30 minutes for outreach, two to three hours for studio time, right? He didn't use the focus, but like the time block uh, names that we use, but he's doing the same thing. He's saying, I'm going to spend this much time on social media, this much time on outreach, and then this much time for studio time art making. Um, and by the way, I, I wanted to share like all of the artists that we've quoted that we're quoting in this uh, presentation today. They're all artists who are full time professional artists. They make their living from their art. So uh, this is why I reached out to them and asked them to share some of their thoughts. Um, Will also uh, is a big fan of goals. Uh, and we talked before about uh, taking your your projects and breaking them down into pieces. Will is very, very good at this, at, at figuring out how to break his things down into uh, smaller pieces. Um, so once you have uh, taken your, you've established your focus block time and your ideal, ideal, the way you're spending your time ideally and the way that you are scheduling yourself, uh, there's some things that we want to start avoiding, right? Uh, and if we could get the next slide. Um, what I will often tell artists is, especially once you go full-time as an artist, uh, you want to start avoiding the things that drain you. And there's four ways uh, that you can avoid what drains you, right? Uh, you can minimize the thing, like do less of it. You can hire somebody to help you do the thing. 
so I, I hire a bookkeeper to help me with my bookkeeping. You can fire the, the thing that you're doing. You can just uh, stop doing that thing. Um, excuse me, let me back up. You can minimize it. You can hire somebody. You can fire the person who's doing it, who's not doing a great job. Um, or you can stop doing the thing altogether. Sometimes we do things because we think we're supposed to be doing them, uh, but we don't actually have to be doing them. Uh, and if you need help figuring out uh, how to know what to minimize, hire, fire, or stop, uh, there's an exercise that I will recommend artists do from the book called Unique Ability. And Basically, once you've done your inventory, you've gone back, gone back and looked at your focus block and you've done your inventory of the past month, um, you make it, you put, put all of those things that you've done for the past month into four categories. And then you can do it on one piece of paper where you draw four, four quadrants on the piece of paper and you label each of those quadrants incompetent, competent, expert, and unique ability. And you put all the things that you did over the past month into those four categories right? Uh, incompetent is exactly what it sounds like. It's the things that you're doing that you're not good at. So for me, that was bookkeeping. I am terrible at bookkeeping. So I put that in the incompetent category. Competent is the things that you know how to do and can do, but you don't get any joy from it and you find them difficult to do. Um, then the uh, expert category is the things that you're good at uh, and that you enjoy doing. And then unique ability is uh, the things that only you can do in your art business. Um, and Ellen asks such a great question here. How on earth can one remember what you've done for the past month? A calendar. Uh, so I made the assumption here that, every, that, that most of the people here are using a calendar. Um, hopefully you are using a planner or a calendar to manage your time. And if you are striving to become a full-time professional artist, uh, I would say that a calendar is probably necessary. Um, and if you are not using a calendar, uh, then you can do this exercise uh, from memory and just try to remember the best you can. Um, or you can start using a calendar or start using a bullet journal or the, just writing down what you're doing every day. Um, <laughs> Barbara says, where do you find a trustworthy bookkeeper? I can address that uh, at the end here. There's, I, I can make some recommendations depending on where you're at in your art business. Um, yeah, it's a good idea to track your time for a month, like Barbara says. Uh, so if you're not currently using a, um, excuse me, like Naomi says, uh, if you're not currently using a calendar, start now and for the next month, just track how much time you're spending on various things each day. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely don't rely on memory, Ellen. Um, I have a terrible memory, so everything I do goes into a calendar, yeah. Uh, so once you have broken down each of the four, th each of your monthly activities into the four categories, incompetent, competent, expert, and unique ability, uh, you just start going through, uh, you just start going through the uh, minimize, hire, fire, or stop steps. And you figure out, okay, of the things that I'm doing that I'm incompetent at, can I stop doing them or do I need to hire somebody to do them, right? And you just sort of work your way through that uh, so that you can do less of the things that you're bad at and more of the things that you're good at. Uh, and as you do that, your art business will snowball. Yeah. All right, uh, can we get the next slide? So Adam Hall, uh, says, figure out what time of day you are at your most productive and then only do your most important tasks then. I love this. Uh, and he again mentions the timer method that Will mentions, the Pomodoro method, where you work on a task for 30 minutes and then take a five minute break. You'd be shocked how much you can get done uh, doing this, doing things this way. So, um, yeah, I love it. Uh, so, I want, I want to talk for a minute before we get into uh, some more tactical things that and tools we can use. Yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so grieving loss projects. Uh, I mentioned the five projects, uh, the five project limit <laughs> the, the, uh, that you should only have five projects in any given time slice. And a lot of times when I mention this, uh, people get uh, upset 
uh, and, and they don't understand, they, they feel like five projects in any given time slice is too limiting, that they have too many things to do. And my pushback there is to say, it's okay to do less. It's okay to do less. Uh, taking care of your kids is a project. Taking care of your uh, sick relative is a project. Um, you know, making a series of art is a project. Working your day job is a project. Uh, and realistically, if we want to do a good job, uh, we need to limit what we do. And that's going to bring up grief. Uh, if you're having a viscerally negative reaction to saying, I can only do this number of things in, in, a, in a day, week, month, or year, uh, that's okay. It's okay to, to be sad about things. And what I will frequently do is if I know that I, there's something I want to do, but I can't do it right now, I'll put it in a lost projects folder or an idea, like ideas for later folder, and I'll come back to it periodically. But I just wanted to sort of recognize that it's normal to grieve the loss of projects that we want to work on. Um, all right, so before we dive into uh, even like uh, all the Q and I see tons and tons of questions coming in. So thank you so much for that. Um, I wanna turn some time uh, back over to Katie uh, to talk a little bit about some of the ways that Artwork Archive can help you with some of the things that I've talked about here. Thank you, yeah, this was so great already. Um... And we have so many good questions to get to get to. So I'll quickly go over um, some of the ways that Artwork Archive can help um, with productivity for artists. Um, it is a platform made specifically for artists, not only to archive your works, um, but also to manage your art business. So it's a core belief of ours that being organized is the foundation to completing projects and not being stressed. Um, we're all artists ourselves, and so we've designed this software to make your life easier and keep things organized so that you're not digging around in files or folders um, when things come up like grants or projects that you want to work on. Being organized, like while it sounds counterintuitive maybe um, for an artist brain, um, really helps cut down on some of the stress and time that goes into planning some of these big projects. So you're not spending as much time on the admin um, because you're not searching for files um, or things that you need to complete the project. Um, so I know a lot of you on here are already Artwork Archive members. So this might be um, things you already know, but for those of you who aren't familiar, this is kind of a high level overview of what Artwork Archive does. Um, we help you get organized um, in terms of all your artwork. So you can have a catalog of all your artwork details and all of your images and all the information related to all of your artwork. So then when someone asks about something, you know exactly where everything is. If someone asks for press images, you can quickly access that. If someone's interested in a geometric series of yours, you can quickly filter and find that. If someone just wants to find all your oil paintings, you can also quickly find all of that and um, work with them on that project. So as Corey mentioned, there are a lot of different projects that are defined um, and this like also helps you with many different projects, but it could be from commissions or sales or creating an online portfolio. Um, getting organized and having everything in the same place is just going to help you um, with that admin side of things. So here's another example. Oop. This is um, an example of getting organized with your shows or locations. So you can quickly see um, what shows you've entered. Um, you can enter them in there. It will give you a show history. You can quickly track where all that information is. And it will also give you a scheduled reminder of when you need to return your items, uh, when you need to, the show opening is, when you need to submit your items. And so it kind of helps with the mental burden of keeping track of that all. Like I know you all mentioned, you know, Corey mentioned having a schedule for all of these things, um, which is something that is built in within Artwork Archive and is automatic then, and it will be updated within your chosen calendar system. So then once you enter a show, not only is it recorded within the system and you can create the provenance of each of your within your artwork record, but then you can also just automatically get reminders of it and not have to think about it. Oop. 
another aspect of getting organized. So there's some key aspects of getting organized. So I would say it would be your artwork, um, your shows, your images, um, which all are possible within Artwork Archive. And then another way to get organized and kind of help with some of these bigger projects. Um, we did mention taxes earlier. So you can keep track of your expenses and your um, revenue within Artwork Archive. So every time you make a sale, that would be automatically entered within Artwork Archive. And you can also then keep track of any expenses that you would have and keep your documents then also just stored in Artwork Archive. So it's basically an all-in-one platform for um, a hub for your information about your art business and art career. So you're organizing all this information. So once you start to have, if you have a project that you want to complete, this is your admin hub. So you're not just wasting time. Um, I know I'm have struggled with staying organized. Um, I have so many folders. I have so many papers. And then I spend hours just trying to find the right image, the right high quality image. Um, and so this is all just makes it so it's very easy to find everything you need so you don't have to be stressed out finding what you need. And this is some of the things that Artwork Archive can help you with um, if you're not familiar. Um, our main goal is to help you catalog and document your artwork um, for a lot of reasons like beyond just project management. Um, it's great for building your legacy. It's great for seeing an overview of your art career in general. Um, and then you can also build up your contacts um, for some marketing um, and other projects. Um, track past exhibitions, which I just spoke about. and logging your income, organizing your documents. Um, so all those things we just touched upon, this is kind of some of the things that can help you with your art business as it goes along. And then, as I mentioned, we do have a scheduling feature. So if you don't have a calendar, um, the scheduling feature is automatic within Artwork Archive. So if you have an upcoming show, it will enter those into your schedule and you can opt into a weekly update. Um, we'll send you what you need to get done for the week on Monday. Um, you can opt into it or choose not to have it if you have too many emails in your inbox, um, but you can choose to do that. And it would look something like this. So it would show you everything you have come up, coming up for the upcoming week, next week, um, the next month, um, and then the year. And you can kind of see, go in there and click um, everything that's coming up. You can also add custom reminders and add reminders uh, through our contact system. So you can create contacts uh, through that are collectors or any other type of contact that you might have. And it works as a contact management system. So you can create a custom reminder for them. And that would send it a reminder to you to say, hey, I need to send a second invoice to this person. Um, I need to follow up about a uh, something we talked about last week. And that's just like another way to not have the mental burden on yourself. Um, just when you're thinking about so many things as artists, we have to do so many things. We have to do marketing, we have to create the work, we have to do the admin. And then if you can just set it aside and create a reminder, I highly recommend it because then it's like the mental burden sometimes just gets in the way of your creativity and um, can seem overwhelming and you can't get anything done then. So this Set, set it aside, come back to it, and like then you'll be able to address it when the time comes. There are also some time-saving aspects, which helps with productivity. Um, so as Corey was mentioning, um, don't waste time with the things that you're not good at, uh, or just why waste time at things that you don't need to do maybe. Uh, so we help you with create very easy to generate reports that you might have been doing um, by hand before or creating invoices in um, different design programs or creating your own inventory reports or portfolio pages or catalogs by hand or certificate authenticity by hand. So you don't have to do that stuff by hand. If you can find a program that will help you do that in one second, um, that will help you free up some time and cut down on the admin time for things. A lot of artists love the reports. It's one of their favorite features, um, simply because even if they love designing things, I'm a designer, it's still very e nice to have something that's just available within one second, and then you can send it off um, to any of your collectors or buyers. 
uh, as we mentioned, we have a lot of resources here. Um, we will address, or we will just send these to you and that you can click these in for further reading. Again, more. And then I think this will be time for our Q&A, Corey. Um, so let's go through some of them here. We're going to ask them, um, I'll read them out loud to Corey. And then if we have further follow-up, I'll ask you to raise your hand. Um, I'll ask, I'll say your name out loud and um, raise your hand and then we'll give you the mic and you guys can have a conversation. So Corey is an art coach. So this is his bread and like, this is what he's great at. So we're gonna, we're looking forward to some interaction and some personal recommendations now. So if you all have specific questions, please feel free to put them in the QA now if you haven't asked them yet. Otherwise, we're just gonna work through uh, some of the questions that we have right now. So we have one from Mary uh, Lonergan. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing any of these right. Um, she has a large international project coming up over the next three to five years, and she's never managed anything like this. Love recommendations on an app or software they can recommend for something like this. Right now, she's starting out an Excel sheet, which is great, but wonder if there's something out there that I might not have heard of specifically to help projects like this. You're muted, Corey. Yeah, gotta unmute myself. Okay, uh, so there are a lot of tools out there, Mary, that are built for uh, doing projects like this. Uh, you know, my favorite one is Asana, but there's lots of them out there. Uh, Asana and uh, what's it called? Trello are two of the most popular ones uh, that both have free options to get started. Um, but Mary, I'm more curious uh, if we wanted to to invite Mary on if she wants to talk about. Uh, I'm curious if the problem is the tool or the overwhelm of trying to plan a project that big and that long. Uh, so, because because a tool, <laughs> yeah, let's let's invite Mary on and talk about it a little bit because uh, I, I, the tool is only part of it. Okay. Yeah. You see the her hand raised. Well done. Let's see, Mary. You might need to click the hand raise, but there it is. All right, here we go. All right, off to Mary. Hey, Mary, are Hi. you there? Hi, Hi I am. Excellent. Thank you, so, thank you so much for addressing the question. Yeah, I have a um a really. I just became a full time artist last year, so mm -hmm. but I have a a very large opportunity coming up um in the next year and then over the next three to five years that's an international project and to say the least I'm a little intimidated so uh -huh. I'm 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 a pretty organized person but I I wondered if there was some kind of a software that basically like a project management type of thing mm -hmm. and then, um also just you know I've never worked internationally before. So mm -hmm. just any kind of tips or anything on that would be helpful. Yeah. So my, my favorite project management of software is Asana. Uh, and you can use that or, or Trello is another very popular one. Uh, but I'm curious, uh, <laughs> Melissa says Artwork Archive needs to plug in their battery. Um, the I, I'm curious, Mary, what is the thing that is most overwhelming about it? What is the thing that you don't know? I think I think the project is just probably going to be larger than I'm even envisioning. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm just um I'm just feeling like um first of all, the the beginning when you were starting off with the breakdown of the calendar, that's just mm -hmm. so helpful. So mm -hmm. I have been doing that on a much smaller scale, but this is going to be pretty big. And mm -hmm. so I'm just I think I'm just feeling like, oh my God, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle this. You know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, well, one, congratulations on leveling up and uh, having the opportunity. So congratulations there. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. So uh, can you give us an idea of what is the project? What is the final end state of the project? Um, the end state, it's going to be 12 boutique hotels, and I'm going to mm -hmm. be doing the artwork for the, these various locations. Mm -hmm. So it's, but they're all going to be international. Those, well, there might be one in New York, but the rest of them mm -hmm. are all going to be international. So, um, you know, 
I don't even have any contacts internationally. Now, I know that the people that I'm going to be working with will have some contacts, mm -hmm. but I think I'm just trying to get a little bit of ahead and start to even pre-plan in my head what might be coming up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't okay, even I have, I have a few. I, I have a few ahead. questions for you. Um, sure. So you're going to be putting or placing uh, artwork in a number of international hotels. Right. How many hotels? 12. 12 hotels. How many pieces? Not even sure yet. Okay. There's your first, first thing to do is figure out how many pieces it's going to be. Yeah. I, yeah, I just won't have that information for probably another six months. So yeah, this okay. is, I think this is why I'm also getting anxious is because I don't have the end details. Mm -hmm. so I'm just mm -hmm. kind of trying to prepare myself. Have you already signed a contract for these, for nope. this work? Nope. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, all right. So it, a few things. One, just figure out how many pieces it's going to be. Uh, okay. Is this original works or prints? Yes. Original and some prints. Original and some prints. Okay. So uh, I just, I, I know how these projects work. Uh, these, these sort of uh, commercial projects work. Um, if it's boutique hotels, they're going to be smallish, right? Uh, maybe right. maybe 20 to 30 rooms at the most if it's a boutique hotel, right? Uh, maybe 50 if it's a large boutique hotel. Um, yeah. And are, is it one piece per room or is it, are you, is it hallway and lobby pieces? I, I don't know. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so then if it's, you know, if it's just hallway and lobby pieces, then you're talking you know, maybe 15 to 20 pieces. Uh, but if it's a piece per room, then we're talking about 50 times 12 is 600, uh, probably prints. Right. Uh, right. and, and then you just plan, uh, according to that. So you just need more information. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't stress out about it. Just say, this is what I need to know. And this is, uh, what you know, when I need to know it by in order to have the things ready. Exactly. But yeah. okay, so that's great. Um, yeah. but so the software that you're recommending to me is Asana. Asana, yeah. That, that's the one that I use. Uh different people like different ones, but yeah, that's the one that I use. And that's ASN ASA. -S -A, okay. Yeah, just like the yoga move. Project management. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. That's helpful. Yep. Yoga move isn't the right term, but you know what I mean. All right. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, good luck, Mary, and have so much fun. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Mary. Um, we will go on to a, we have some a few other ones. Woo. Okay. For time blocking, are there any examples for part-time artists with about four mm -hmm. to five hours in the evening? Yeah, great question. Yeah, great question. Um, so generally speaking, if you've got a full-time job uh, and whoever anonymous is, um, <laughs> okay, uh, it, if you have a full-time job, uh, I'm going to assume that you don't have more than like an hour commute, right? Uh, so you might be home by six o'clock in the evening, right? Um, you've got a recovery block in there, which means you need to eat dinner, right? Uh, so that's part of your time. Uh, in the evening, generally speaking, you're going to get one focus block, right? So whatever time that is for you, uh, for myself, it's going to be, you know, like somewhere between seven and nine uh, is going to be my 90 minute to two hour focus block. Uh, it might be eight to 10, depending on who you are, or maybe you're a night owl and your focus block is 10 to midnight. Uh, but whatever that looks like for you. Uh, so you get a recovery block, a focus block, and probably an admin block. And you might put your admin block, you know, right before you go to bed, or you might put the admin block first thing in the morning so that you wake up, check all your emails, do all your admin work, go to work, come home and have an hour and a half to two hours of uh, focus work. And basically you, there, there's two ways you can divide up the focus work. Uh, either you alternate nights. So one night you make, you make art, and the other night you do marketing and, and growth, uh, audience growth work, um, or you uh, block it out in the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you do marketing. And then uh, uh, Saturday, you spend a couple of hours making art, 
like whichever works best for you. And you can play around with both of those formats to see which works best. And it might change over time, but that's sort of the mental framework that I use to think about it. Hopefully that answers Anonymous's question. I hope so as well. Um, we had a few questions about Artwork Archive that I will uh, quickly uh, run yeah. over. Uh, a few people asked if the scheduling, you can also export that or integrate that with uh, your calendar of choice. You can. Um, so if you have your schedule, you can click the three dots right next to it and then sync that up with your GCal or iCal or any calendar that you use. So while it uh, automatically will sync up with all of your exhibitions and reminders, then you can also put that into, say you're just using your GCal or you want to have it on your um, your phone, you can also do that. Uh, we had another question. You can find all pricing at artworkarchive.com slash pricing. Someone asked about that. Um, I think those are two big ones. Let's see what else we have here. Corey, did you see any that jumped out? Yeah. Um... Let's see. Okay. Uh, Elaine says, I avoid social media, but I know I have to do it. <laughs> I've avoided it for six months and I need to get back to it. Uh, so uh, there are lots of people who have this question and uh, the refrain that I hear from artists over and over again is I hate social media, right? Um, so if Elaine wants to come on and talk about it, uh, I would love to have her on. Uh, so Elaine, if you're, if you want to talk about it, hit the raise hand button so we can find you and, uh, we'll invite you on to talk about it a little bit. Uh, yeah. And if not, that's okay. We can, I can answer it. Or if somebody else wants to talk about social media, we can do that too. I think she's here, but you're unmuted. Well, okay, there I go. Yeah. There hi. we go. Hi, Elaine. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. so Elaine, tell me what you hate about social media. Well, I worked with, you know, it's 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 so constant. It's like if you make a a, a post, you have to respond to all the people who who mm -hmm. respond to your post. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had kind of a surgery, ser a serious surgery in the fall, and then mm -hmm. I just kind of like let it go, and I mm -hmm. haven't been able to get back to it. What mm -hmm. I did is when I was working on it, I had a, a a chart I made so that every time I did like Facebook or um, LinkedIn or Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, then I would write it down and I had a really good schedule going. And then uh -huh. I can't seem to get back to it now uh -huh. that I'm actually making artwork again. Right. So, uh, were you seeing results from your social media marketing? I was. I mean... Yeah, okay. I had a lot of responses and a lot of, um, you know, positive stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. were you seeing I, sales I, from your social media? Well, I just saw one sale. Okay. So no, uh, I mean, not really. Sure. But I'm doing this series that isn't really, a. it's, it's not something people want to buy. It's all these industrial landscapes. So I'm mm -hmm. trying to just make a body of work and mm -hmm. let people know about it. Um, and then do a show at, at some point. I'm confused. Uh, you just told me that you're making a series of work that nobody's going to want to buy, but then you also just said that you're going to do a show. Right, a show, like a, like a gallery show or a museum show or something. Why it's, would you do a gallery show if, if you think people aren't going to buy the work? Well, I was thinking more like a museum show or something because, well, I don't know who wants to buy paintings of cell towers and um and like like industrial things i mean people uh, love the work though it's what is it, let me ask let me ask you this elaine what is your goal with the art why why are you uh making the art i'm making the art because it's what's inspiring mm -hmm. me now and mm -hmm. i'm a, a retired teacher so i was making a good amount of money like selling normal paintings and now mm -hmm. I'm just doing this so and okay so you don't actually what I'm hearing you say is you don't need to grow a social media following and you don't need to sell the work because you have other income sources is that correct that well that's correct but I do like the idea of having a following 
Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then in, in that case, if there's no like immediate need for revenue, and this is normal for a fairly significant number of artists, uh, then just do what makes sense for you and do what's fun. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like if, if there's a way that you can make social media fun, do that. Right. Okay. I think there's, a, there's a lot of, um, a lot of marketing people in an effort to like make it palatable and make it easy to teach. They tell, they tell everybody, okay, you got to do social media at this time. You got to do the same time every day. You got to do every social channel. I heard you earlier saying that you did Facebook and LinkedIn and, and Instagram. You don't have to do all that. Uh, what okay. you actually want to do is what you actually want to do is what's effective and what meets your goals. Okay. Uh, so if uh, you just want to grow your following and uh, engage with people uh, yeah. is, is totally fine and have fun with it. You know, see, see what the trends are, make some videos, make some reels, uh, respond to people who are responding to your work, all totally valid ways of handling it. Yeah. Okay. Is there a time block is there an ideal time block for someone like me um, to spend um, doing this? I mean, I do want to engage a following. Mm -hmm. I do want to eventually have more sales. It's mm -hmm. just not my goal right now. I'm trying to get a body of work. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, you put that in your uh, admin block uh, and call it 15 or 20 minutes every few days. Okay. And that's probably fine. See, that's doable. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was helpful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Aline. Um, we have another one, Corey, for you. Um, mm -hmm. How much time would you recommend working on grants or residency or exhibition proposals? Mm. Things that you're not sure um, are going to come through. Um, mm -hmm. Those grants and opportunities can take a lot of time and they're not guaranteed. Um, do you have yeah. a recommendation for how long you should be spending on those type of opportunities? Yeah, great question. Um, so Laura, uh, the art, I, I quoted an art, artist earlier, uh, Rhonda Gray. And Rhonda is actually fueling her art career in large part through grants. Right. And it depends on the kind of art that you're making and what you want to do with your art. Okay. So Rhonda, uh, a large portion of her body of work is murals that celebrate the history of things like the Underground Railroad and other elements of Black history in the United States. Right. So there's not a easy commercial market for that work. However, there's a large number of grant making organizations that want to see that kind of work happen and they want to fund it. So it makes sense for Rhonda to pursue that kind of work. If your work is more commercial, uh, if your work, if you're doing large numbers of small pieces, uh, if your work is, is more easy to sell, then I would not recommend going the grant route because the grant route is typically, you know, other than some small like artist development grants, most of the large grants go to artists who are doing uh, mission driven statement work like Rhonda. Uh, so and, you know, that's not always true. There's, there are some grants that just do, you know, large blocks to artists who are doing very commercial work. But uh, I think if you're, it just depends on the kind of work that you're doing. Um, that said, even with the grant writing that Rhonda is doing, uh, even though the preponderance of her income comes from grant writing, she still sells uh, to private collectors and has a small line of originals that she sells as a way of diversifying her income stream. Uh, so if I were going to break it down, uh, you know, if we're talking about the 50-50, where 50% 50 of her art business time is on the business side, and of that, uh, probably 60 or 70% of it comes uh, is grant writing and all of the administrative work that comes from uh, getting grants running and, and all of that work. Uh, and then the other 20, 30% is growing her private collector base. Okay, do we have a follow up? Are we good there? Okay. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's all I had for now, unless she has more questions. 
Okay, cool. Well, let's yeah. go on to Deborah. This is an artwork mm -hmm. archive question um, that mm -hmm. we've gotten a few times. Um, people are wondering um, if the info has to be put into the archive by yourself. Um, what's the best way to get started? How long does it take? Um, and that um, I can't answer because everyone has it depends on how large your inventory is to start with. Um, we do offer an import system. So if you've been keeping track of it in um, Excel or a spreadsheet, we can import that information for you. Or if you have it in a different program, we can also import that information. I would say that the best way to get started is with your most current work and work backwards. So um, the things you've most recently made and then keep going back since those are the things that are the freshest in your memory and you can just answer right away. Like, you know what the name is, you know who it's sold to, you know the dimensions and then work back in time. And hopefully you still have a lot of the information from a few years ago of um, the work that wasn't documented yet and then go forward from there. So um, we have some resources available again within the slides to help with the process. I know that it's a lot to get set up at first, um, but being organized, it does, it's like a little bit of legwork. It's kind of like working out, like it's kind of painful at first, but like it helps you stay alive longer. So we do it <laughs> um, and it makes your life easier and better. So um, we do it up front and it helps get, and we do have a great support team to help get set up and a lot of good videos and, and information to get started. And then it does make your life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, and one thing, one thing I will say here is uh, Susan or whoever was asking about like, how do I find the time to inventory my work? Mm -hmm. uh, either you inventory your work now uh, by spending, you know, call it 15, 20 minutes every few days doing the work or your estate inventories your artwork after you die and they're going to get it wrong because they just do not have the information that's in your brain. Uh, and it's going to take an enormous amount of uh, investment of time and resources to inventory your work. So by breaking it down into, you know, 20, 30 minute increments every few days or every, or every week, uh, you will be able to get through all of it. Uh, it's just it, it's work that needs to get done. Uh, and for those of you who are younger in your career and don't have hundreds or thousands of paintings yet, let this be a object lesson uh, to say like, you need to inventory your work, uh, you know, because the longer you put it off, the harder it will be, because not only will there be more work, but you'll forget uh, where everything is and what it is and all that, all that stuff. So uh, I have a, a good friend uh, who recently showed me her inventory spreadsheet uh, that she maintains. And she's, you know, a, a, an artist in her mid forties who uh, has made thousands of pieces of art and managing that spreadsheet is an enormous task. So don't delay it uh, because the longer you delay it, the harder it will be. Exactly. And if you can, again, spend 20 minutes every week um, entering what you did that week, um, mm -hmm. it'll just help. You know, my problem is even beyond your legacy, accessing that information, like I will waste if I before Artwork Archive, I would waste hours a week just trying to find the high resolution image on my crowded desktop um, before that and like what it matched up to or what show and like I, along with many of our users, um, have horror stories about accidentally submitting works to multiple locations or selling things online and then also was promised to a gallery. So it helps you kind of keep track and avoid um, some of these bigger obstacles um, and avoid the crisis. But it does it does require like it is an exercise in just like 20 minutes every week um, getting your stuff in there, but it does help some of the crises in the future. All right. Let's see. Okay, we answered that question, the the grants and residency question. And uh, this is an easy one. When entering work, you can Josephine, you can sort um, by any by date, name, anything within Artwork Archive. Um, to see your work filtered or sorted. So you can do medium. Um, there's a bunch of different sort and filters. So I will answer that one. Let's see. 
Okay, uh, Deborah has a great question that I think that I think I want to answer. How do you advise making sales with Instagram with someone you don't know? I had an inquiry, but not sure how genuine it is. Is there an advisable protocol? Yeah. Uh, so I know quite a few artists who just uh, sell their art on Instagram and they don't have a website or they don't really use their website. Uh, so if somebody says I'm interested, uh, the thing to do is to direct message them back and say, you know yeah, hey, uh, I saw that you're interested. Uh, you know, here's the information about the work. It's, you know, these are the dimensions. This is the price. Uh, you know, would you like to, would you like me to package it up and ship it to you? Uh, and if they say yes, then you say, great, I'll send you a, an invoice. Uh, and when you pay the invoice, I'll go ahead and ship, right? Uh, and you can send them an invoice via PayPal or uh, have them just, if you want to use Cash App or Venmo or something, you can do that. Uh, and then you manage your whole art business through your mobile device that way. Um, just make sure that you're not shipping anything before they pay the invoice. And that's how you keep yourself from getting scammed. Uh, so that's a high level of answer to that question, Deborah. Uh, if you do DM somebody and they don't respond, uh, you might want to reply to their comment publicly because they might have DM notifications turned off. Um, or they might just like be initially interested and then they're not, and then they don't want to follow up because they don't actually want it. So that's, that's certainly possible as well. Uh, let's see. Holly Sedgwick says, uh, I need more direction on promotion so I can sell more work. I have a big body of work that I've got organized on Artwork Archive. Awesome. I also post on Instagram and Facebook regularly. So Holly, if, if we wanted to invite Holly on, uh, I'd love to chat about this for a minute because uh, I can just give out broad yeah. advice, but if, if I know more about her situation, that's helpful. Holly, can you raise your hand? I'm not sure if she's here. Let me see. That's okay. Holly. Hi, I'm here. Sorry, I was. Hey, Holly. Here. There you are. Hey, Corey. Hi. Um, um, so what, like, right now, you said you post on Instagram and Facebook regularly. What else are you doing to sell your work? Okay, so just, I want to just tell you, I know this is too much information, but let me just say I had a brain injury last year, which really threw a big, um, you know, mess for me. So I hired someone to put everything on artwork, artwork archive, simply because mm -hmm. I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to really work anymore. And um, right now I'm building myself, actually, I'm not yet building myself back up. I'm still in recovery and unable to be in front of screens for too long. And mm -hmm. I'm just uh, going through a huge um, metamorphosis with everything, including my mm -hmm. work. So yeah. I have basic questions now that I never really had the courage to, to bring up that now I'm mm -hmm. being you know, I'm forced to ask. Um, and one of them is, yes, I do post daily, pretty much mostly old work now um, on uh, Instagram. And um, I'm doing a whole lot of different things that I couldn't do, but I, that I can only do now. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been posting those. And I had a huge sale about eight months ago on, from Instagram from someone I actually knew but sometimes I get feedback from Instagram that's uh, weird. Like I had two scam things and I want to share them just because it's a heads up. Uh, they, these in twice, it's probably the same person pretending to be someone else, but they showed interest in my art and said they wanted to send me um, a, a work check rather than PayPal. And um, I did it once and the next time I, I cut them off. But when I did it, um, it was supposed to go directly into my bank. It was just a weird thing. And um, it was bad. I didn't send the work. I didn't do anything. It, it all worked out with my bank. But it is really important to only stick to those platforms and not accept checks and stuff. Mm -hmm. From strangers and just wanted to say that so that nobody goes through what I went through. <laughs> sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely always wait until the check clears before you ship the work. Um, so Holly, yeah. uh, wh where are you based? I'm in Toronto. In Toronto. Okay. So uh, one thing that I will say, especially for those who's uh, who have to limit their screen time, 
one thing that a lot of early art career artists can benefit from is what I call a living room show. Uh, mm -hmm. where you, and it doesn't have to be specifically your living room. It's just a way of saying it. But you basically invite over 10 to 15 friends, uh, have an evening. It doesn't have to be longer than an hour where you invite everybody over. You have some, some drinks, maybe, maybe some snacks. You spend five minutes talking about two or three pieces of your work. It's not a hard pitch. Uh, and then you call it a night at the end of the hour um, or just keep going if you're having fun. Uh, but doing these sort of uh, uh, living room shows uh, accomplishes a couple of things. One, it lets more people know about your work. Uh, two, it gives you an opportunity to practice talking about your work so that you get good at, at telling your story. Uh, and three, uh, a lot of times, even without a pitch, if you're just talking about the inspiration behind the work and what it is, uh, a lot of times, if you're in a group of 10 people, one or two of those people will be interested in purchasing the work, even without you necessarily pitching it. Uh, and if you can get on a cadence where you're doing, you know, one of these a month or something like that, you'll start to build momentum in your sales. Uh, and then you can flip it once you get a sale or two in your local area to where you're doing a living room show in your collector's living room. And that's when things start to really snowball. Oh, wow. That's a great idea. And that's a great way to be off, to be interacting. Uh, one of the big things I learned in my recovery is connection heals the brain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. life to life yep. connection. And it's not healing my brain to be on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. I need to be in real life time with people. And yep. so this is, of course, changing my whole life and, of course, my work. So, yeah, yeah great, yeah. great feedback, Corey. Thank you. Absolutely. Good luck, Holly. Thanks, Corey. Let's see. Uh, I'm curious in the chat, like somebody asked, uh, when you're learning a new artistic medium, do you watch the video completely and then paint re by rewatching section by section? Uh, so if anybody in the chat wants to add, add, answer what they do, I think that'd be a better answer than my answer. Let's see. I have um, one from Barbara mm -hmm. that I think would be interesting. Um, do you recommend working in a series instead of a variety from landscapes to portraits? I work in seasonal yeah. blocks, spring, fall, plein air, and studio landscape. August begins portraits because she wants to do more winter studio. Wondering if there's a consistency in one genre is better. How do you do blocking like that? Mm, yeah. So when we're talking about building a portfolio of work, uh, it's important that you establish a portfolio that is consistent and makes sense, right? Uh, and, and what I mean by that is not one particular medium. Uh, I'm not saying you need to do uh, one whole series that is all abstract expressionist paintings so much as uh, you need to have a series of work that is fueled by the same ideas, Right. So, for example, uh, I mean, Gwen Seymour is an artist that I like a lot, and she had a series a few years ago called um, Crime Against Nature. And it was a series of paintings that were all paintings of animals that didn't conform to normal, what we would call normal gender expectations, right? So like seahorses, uh, the male seahorse carries the babies to term. Uh, there are male deer that don't have antlers and all kinds of things like that. So that idea around uh, gender identity and expression was what fueled the series uh, and that's the, when we talk about making work in a series, that's what we're talking about. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Uh, if, you're, if your work is all over the place uh, in your portfolio, it's going to be much harder to sell your work because people won't be able to identify what, what it is you do. And they people have to be able to sort you into a category in order to uh, get excited about promoting your work. Okay. Let's see. We have a few questions on how to best photograph or scan paintings. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a good suggestion for that? Uh, boy, that's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> how to, uh, so we have some resources on it. Uh, let me find, there. there's a couple of resources I can point to on our website. Uh, let's see, here we go. 
Uh, I mean, the best thing you can do is find a photographer who specializes in this. Uh, but uh, so here's an article I'm posting in the chat on photographing your art for your website. Uh, but that is different than like talk, like if you're talking about scanning and photographing the work to make prints, that is a completely different thing. Uh, and that really requires a professional photographer or going to a print studio and, and finding a print studio that has a uh, scanner that will handle uh, artwork and that the print shop will is willing to do color corrections. And, and it's, a, it's a professional practice to do that. If you don't know how to do it, you need to find a professional to do it. Uh, Staley has this question in the chat that I always want to address. Um, I have any suggestions for parents of young kids. I have three young children and keep getting knocked totally off track for weeks at a time due to sickness, teething, et cetera. Yes. Um, yes, focus time is extremely difficult to come by. Uh, so Staley, uh, if Staley wants to come on, Staley, if you want to raise your hand, I definitely want to talk about this because uh, I think that parenting gets totally undersold as uh, a, a massive project or two in and of itself. Uh, so if Staley wants to hit the uh, raise hand button, I'm more than happy to talk about that for a minute. Uh, and if not, I can just talk high level. Staley? How do you... Staley Pearl. There we go. Hi, Staley. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, Staley, first of all, congratulations on having children. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, where's home for you, Staley? Um, I'm in San Luis Obispo, California, and I have, okay. uh, yeah, three. And so I appreciated that you mentioned them as projects. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, I guess I get two projects a year because I have three young kids. Correct. <laughs> uh, it's like my my wife is number two of nine kids. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, and and her parents always used to say, like, make jokes about how uh, once you got three kids, like, what's one more? Mm. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's entirely true, but uh, I think you start to like as a parent, you start to become efficient. Uh, like you learn how to do things and how to batch things together. But um, yeah, I definitely feel like I'm at my peak um, yeah. with kids, mm -hmm. but I, yeah, 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 batching is my main thing. Like I'm really into, but the focus time is something mm -hmm. like trying not to get interrupted. I just mm -hmm. can't seem to land on a medium, um, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, a, a thing that some parents don't want to hear, sometimes you just have to wait for your kids to get older. How, like, how old are they? Uh, one, three, and five. Yeah. So you're right in the uh, thick of like, that's the hardest part, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when they're that young, it's very difficult to say, uh, you know, hey, one-year-old, go over there and don't bother me for an hour. Uh, that's just not going to happen, right? Uh, and so then you have to sort of call in help. Uh, so, you know, do you have a partner? Do you have a family member or a friend who can spell you and give you a focus block here or there? Yeah, you know, it's it's often like with COVID and things like I'll get like a, a two hour chunk once a week and I have mm -hmm. a show coming up in October um, mm -hmm. and I just keep getting behind and behind because it keeps, you know, someone has COVID or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I get it. And it's totally difficult. Uh, and I think uh, recognizing that there's no easy way through that uh, mm -hmm. and, and just saying you need help. Uh, and, you know, if COVID is taking away your babysitter time uh, or preventing your partner from helping you, you might need some additional help. Yeah, whether, that feels like yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, so whether that is calling in uh, you know, a paid babysitter or some, finding a friend who can help you or somebody that you can exchange babysitting time with, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe you've, maybe there's another parent who can take your kids for two hours so you can, uh, make work and then you take their kids for two hours later, uh, whatever, uh, but, but you need to find a way to get some help rather than thinking that you're going to get focus time, uh, with them there. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I joined a gym that has, um, really, really cheap childcare for two hours at a time. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so uh, like this morning I, I was there for an hour and I just did plain air painting at the gym. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. No muscles, but you know, um, I love it. I yeah, love it. Any uh, hat you have, I am all ears. Mm-hmm. That is, that is exactly the kind of ingenuity that I'm talking about when I say that nobody is better at getting things done than a parent with young kids. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, uh, you know, bless, bless you. I, I don't think that there's uh, an easier way around it than what you're doing. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for acknowledging it early on. And when you were talking about projects, children as a project that I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Let's see. Uh, looking for the next question. Let's this see. one may be from Nicolene um, about something you right. had mm-hmm. mentioned about figurative artists. Cap out financially. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. I don't know if that's exactly what I meant. Okay. So uh, I'll just talk about this for a second. So uh, Nicolene, uh, I think what I was talking about on another webinar is that there is a income cap for pet portraits, uh, animal portraits, right? Uh, Because people are willing to spend a lot on their pets, but they're only willing to spend so much. Uh, And the business model for most pet portrait artists is to make a lot of pet portraits. Uh, And so you, you sort of crank out two or three, like I know some pet portrait artists who charge $250 per piece and they do two or three of them a day. Uh, and that is, you know, they, and they've got months long waiting lists, but even that is a cap, right? If you're making $500 a day, five days a week, uh, at 50 weeks a year, uh, that's 2,500 times 50, whatever that is, uh, that's not that much money. Uh, and so that's what I'm talking about when I say there's an income cap, but if we're talking about like professional portraits, uh, uh, like that's a totally different realm uh, because then you're getting into something like very wealthy people paying $20,000 to have dad painted. Like it, that's a completely different uh, realm. So hopefully that uh, adds a little more detail uh, on that. And um, part of the reason that landscape and uh, abstract artists uh have a, a different sort of income cap is because of reproductions and prints and licensing, uh, where if you're doing a uh, portrait of one very wealthy person, uh, generally speaking, you're not going to be able to do a, a lot of reproductions of that piece uh, unless it becomes as famous as the Mona Lisa, which is probably not going to happen. So that's that. Hopefully that answers that question, Nicolene. Let's see. Uh, Jane says, is there a way to keep track of legit discussions you've had with potential clients on certain pieces? Uh, You know what, Katie, I think you can talk about the CRM function of Artwork Archive here. Yeah, that's a perfect example for the CRM. Um, You can keep track of not only the discussions you've had um, throughout your Artwork Archive um, communications, but you can also just make notes of it um, throughout your record in the CRM. I don't know if it's in here, but through contacts, um, we do have a system. So every time you're having a conversation with a collector, um, you should be documenting that. Um, But then within Artwork Archive, if you send them a private room, if they have a discussion, if they send you, if you send them an invoice, that's all cataloged um, within that art, within that record on the contact. So you can go back and see, oh, I, I know I talked to them in June. Um, I know that they were interested, but they said follow up in a month. Um, that's very common. And then you can see, you can easily see what you need to do um, and how to follow up and also have a personal touch. So say they let you had a conversation, they mentioned their kids, you can know about that and just you have the personal touch and human touch with them as well. Yeah. Um, I want to answer Maggie's question here about, uh, she says, I have a uh, gallery representation in a major Southern city. Woo. The price is set by the gallery are very high. Typically online sales at these prices are close to impossible. Okay. Um, I live about 60 miles from the gallery and we have no exclusive agreement. Okay. Selling that work for less than the gallery is frowned upon. Your comments about this would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. So never undercut your gallery. 
uh, <laughs> please don't ever do this. Uh, and if, and this is a, a trade-off that a lot of artists don't think about when they start selling through galleries. Once your work is sold in a gallery, um, people who buy the work in a gallery are going to expect that the rest of your work is also at that price, right? So you're sort of making a tacit agreement, even if it's not explicit, that your pricing is going to be that from then on, or investor collectors will stop buying your work, right? So that's just something to think about. Um, when you say prices at that price point online are impossible, um, I would challenge that assumption because Christie's, Sotheby's, and other, uh, and, and then a lot of galleries like uh, Jason Horish's gallery in Scottsdale is called Xanadu Gallery, uh, regularly doing five and six figure online sales. Uh, you're talking about ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars in uh, per piece online sales. Uh, so the reason they're able to do that is that they have developed relationships with people over time. Um, their reputations help as well, like Christie's is Christie's. But uh, there are plenty of artists that I know who sell pieces off of Instagram or off of their website that are five, 10 grand or more um, because they have developed a relationship with that collector over time, uh, over one, three, five years or longer. Uh, and quite often that collector has bought a small piece or, uh, or a print early on. Uh, and then later on, they upgrade to a, a more expensive original over time. So, uh, don't, don't think that on the large online sales are impossible. They're not. And don't undercut your gallery. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think we have about five more minutes, so we can okay. take one more and then uh, wrap it up. And yeah. if we didn't answer your question again, um, we'll be sending out the slides, but also you shoot either of us an email directly, happy to answer all questions. Um, and again, this will all be sent out tomorrow. Um, but yeah, Corey, why don't you pick the, the last one? Um, okay, so Karen says, I do botanical art. Um, how and who should I be marketing to? Uh, so it depends on where you live, Karen, uh, but I'll give you a great example. Uh, an artist in the UK that I know, uh, there was a large outdoor uh, flower show, like a flower grower show, and she got her art placed in the central atrium uh, where, where everybody could go in and buy seeds and starters for the work. Uh, so people who like flowers, find places where people who like flowers go. Um, uh, so nurseries, botanical shows, uh, any, any, any of those kinds of places uh, are, are great places to start. Uh, and then as far as online, uh, finding newsletters and websites that are about flowers and nature are really good. And then finding like Instagram accounts that have a large follow, large engaged following that are uh, specifically focused on flowers and the kind of work that you do uh, is a great partnership. It's a great marketing partnership. Hope that helps. All right, should we call it a day, Katie? I think so. Yeah, this was so great. Thank you again, Corey, um, and everyone for your great questions and for taking the time out of your day to be with us uh, today. It was so great to hear how to structure our time better and hear some of your really interesting questions. So um, I'm so appreciative of everyone taking the time. Thanks so much, everybody. We really appreciate it. All right, bye. And if we didn't answer it, please reach out to both of us, uh, team at artworkarchive.com, Corey at uh, theabundantartist.com.